what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, once again we bow before you. We acknowledge that we are in need of being taught and instruct, instructed, our eyes opened, our hearts enlarged, our affections drawn after you. We thank you so much for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that the same one who inspired this word can now illuminate our hearts and minds to understand it and to apply it for the sake of Christ in his gospel. In his name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Fake news, misinformation, disinformation. There are some who claim that they are unsure of what is true. The Department of Homeland Security proposed a solution, create a disinformation governance board to decide what is real and what is fiction. Ronald Reagan famously remarked, the closest thing to eternal life on earth is a government program. Thankfully, that will not be the case with the disinformation governance board. It appears it will no longer uh, exist to police such things. I think the public has access to enough resources to determine what is true and what is false as it concerns the news. But there is a bigger question for our culture, and that is, is there such a thing as truth? Or is everything just a statement of opinion or preference? Does truth exist? Once the answer was obvious, but no longer. Paul Copan the, at Palm Beach Atlantic University notes that truth is going through a tough time. A white woman feels black and represents herself to be so. She rises in the leadership ranks of the NAACP until her fiction is exposed. She refuses to go quietly, however, she feels she is black, and therefore she must be black. A 69-year-old man in the Netherlands petitions the court to legally change his age to 49 because that's how he feels. And of course, we hear endlessly about men and women who declare themselves to be something other than what they are biologically. A viral video of a 5'9 uh, Caucasian male asked students at the University of Washington to acknowledge that he's Chinese, or six foot five, or a woman. Some hesitate, but no one will tell him what he's saying is not true, that he's not what he says he is. That would be mean and intolerant. This true for you, but not for me, relativism is disconcerting because it requires the acceptance of obvious contradictions denies reality and even common sense. Rather than adjusting our lives to the truth, the truth has, has to adjust itself to us. That's the view of the culture. But it's very difficult to live that way, and it's really highly impractical. We rely on universal truths in order to think clearly. 
to navigate our way through life. Otherwise, we quickly get lost. There must be some things that just are, things that are true. This way points north for everybody, no matter what anybody thinks or what anybody's opinion might be. So what is truth? At its root, truth is a matchup with reality. It corresponds to what God has made and what God has said. A story, a statement, a belief is only true if it lines up with what is real. It's like a socket wrench fitting perfectly onto a bolt. Reality as fashion and defined by our creator makes something true. To say that the earth is flat or the moon is made out of cheese is false. Why? Because it doesn't match up with reality. Until quite recently, the purpose of all education in large part was a pursuit of the truth. The motto at Harvard University is veritas, the Latin for truth. But that's no longer the main concern. Anyone who says education should be about the pursuit of truth is immediately shot down with the comeback, whose truth? Increasingly, people speak of my truth, or they say it's true for me, or your truth, as though truth were merely a matter of preference or opinion. A few years ago, a celebrity famously said that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we all have. Now, you can have your experience, you can have your preference, but there is no such thing as your truth or my truth. There is only the truth. This notion of your truth undermines the idea of shared common facts. And there's another problem with your truth. If your truth is true, anyone who doesn't hold to that truth must be wrong. And this typifies those in the woke crowd. It's very interesting. They don't want to engage in debate. They prefer indoctrination of the submissive and condemnation of those who resist. They take offense at every opportunity and demand not just apologies, but concessions. Believe my truth or else. Not exactly a positive message. Truth can't be relative. If it's relative, it's not truth. To say there is no truth for all people is to declare a truth for all people. And to declare that both your opinion and my opinion are true, even if they contradict each other, is to speak nonsense. Truth isn't opinion or preference. It's not subjective or relative. It is inescapable because reality is inescapable. And no amount of double talk can change that. What about the truth of the gospel? Last week, we saw from Paul's sermon that our faith is rooted in God's saving acts in history. God made another, a number of promises to his people that culminated in the coming of the Messiah. Through David's offspring, God brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus, as was promised. That's in verse 23. Based upon what God has done in history through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life is offered to anyone who will repent and believe. This is the message Paul preached, and the people were eager to hear more. Now, one would think that those who profess faith in the God of Israel would be thrilled to learn that after all these centuries, he had finally fulfilled his promises to save his people. This was good news, indeed the greatest news ever. But what we find in our passage today is that the gospel is not always received as good news. The truth of what Jesus has done, which is meant to set us free, is sadly rejected by those who prefer to define truth independently of God, and consequently remain in bondage to error and to sin. In a perfect world, everybody would embrace the truth. But in our fallen world, truth divides. Some people believe it, while others do not. 
So the first thing I want us to see this morning is that neutrality to truth is impossible. Neutrality is impossible. There are always two responses to the truth of the gospel, just as there are only two roads down which people travel through this life into eternity. There's the response of faith, and there's the response of unbelief. Luke describes the reaction to Paul's preaching starting in verse 42. Some responded positively. They begged Paul and Barnabas to return again in the following Sabbath, if they might hear some more. As they were leaving the synagogue, it says many Jews and devout converts to Judaism began to follow Paul and Barnabas and question them further, which was a sign of God's work of grace in their hearts. The next week we're told that there were Gentiles who believed, and they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, but others rejected the message. Verse 45. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. Some of your translations say they were blaspheming, suggesting that they were talking abusively about the name of Jesus. Not all Jews opposed Paul's teaching, but in general, the reaction to the gospel divided along ethnic lines. Now, in the book of Acts, jealousy seems to be the typical reaction of the Jewish leadership as the apostles' teaching grows in popularity and threatens to eclipse the Jewish establishment. And this is inevitable for those who are concerned more about power and prestige than they are serving God. In Acts 5, we're told that the Sadducees were filled with jealousy as the crowds came out to hear the apostles proclaim the gospel. In Acts 17, Luke says the Jews were jealous when some of their own and a large number of God-fearers in Thessalonica were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas. And then we have this incident in Acts 13. Now this morning during our Sunday school class, and I should mention it just started today, a new series on 1 John, and Juan Fulch mentioned, which is absolutely true, that the first Christians, for the most part, were Jewish until Paul's mission to the Gentiles. Of course, there was Cornelius and others, but really the, the inclusion of the Gentiles, the ingathering of the Gentiles, started with Paul's first missionary journey. But at some point the Jewish people start to become hardened and resistant, at least the Jewish leaders. Those who opposed Paul were not jealous for the glory of God, but for their own standing in the community. The balance of power was shifting, and the Jewish officials obviously felt threatened. Now, this kind of jealousy is common among politicians, as they vie for dominance and attention, they are often shameless in their promotion of self and their denigration of others. But a spirit of jealousy can also rear its ugly head in the church, which is terribly shameful. We ought to rejoice when others are doing well. We, we desire every Christian and every church to flourish. Benjamin Franklin made this observation. He said, it is our desire to be seen in the eyes of other people that ruins us. If all but myself were blind, I should want neither a fine house nor fine furniture. If we are jealous, let us be jealous for the fame of God's name. But there was something else going on here, in a word, prejudice. They did not like the fact that the Gentiles were receiving the same salvation and the same blessings that they had. All these years, think about it, they were maintaining their Jewish distinctiveness, keeping themselves clean from the impure pagan lifestyle of the wider world. They had sought to be true to the commandments that marked them out from the rest of the world. They had suffered many things to be true to their heritage. And now all of a sudden these pagans surrounding them were going to come flooding into their world 
without having to adopt their practices. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. You have to keep all the laws just like us. But Jesus came for the express purpose of freeing those who believe from everything from which they could not be freed from the law of Moses. So with the coming of the new age in Jesus Christ, salvation is open freely and equally to the Gentiles. As the Jewish leaders were slandering God's good news, Paul and Barnabas were fulfilling their calling, as noted in verse 47. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you might bring salvation to the ends of the earth. This had been God's plan all along to include the Gentiles, people like us. But the Jewish leaders want everyone to stay in their system of works. You see, the gospel robs people of any ground for boasting and their pride couldn't handle it. Who is resisting Paul? It's the religious crowd. And they were so opposed to it that they rallied others to join them. This is terribly ironic that devout Jews who would normally keep themselves separated from the pagans are now joining together with them in order to fight against the gospel. Verse 50. But the Jews incited the devout women of the city and stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. Now, it seems amazing to us, those of us who love and worship Jesus, that anyone should reject him. He comes to us so tenderly, so gently as the Lamb of God. All he does is so generous and so sacrificial. We marvel that any would refuse him. What has he done that someone should refuse to become his disciple and accept his salvation? Well, we know the answer. It is the natural response of a heart hardened by sin to pursue a self-directed life rather than to come into the light of the gospel. But though we are bound in sin, we're still responsible for our choices. And you notice how Paul and Barnabas respond to their fellow countrymen. It's, it's pretty sharp, uh, but it was necessary. Verse 46, they say, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. The gospel had to be preached to the Jews first. God had made his promises to the nation of Israel, and so they were the first to hear what God had done. But having rejected the gospel, Paul now concentrates on the Gentiles. And in Romans, he makes it clear that not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Just because you belong to God's covenant people outwardly doesn't mean that you're a child of God, that you really trust in him. There is a remnant, Paul says, chosen by grace. But for the most part, Israel has been uh, hardened in part. They've experienced a hardening in part, Paul says. The truth is, anyone who rejects the promised Savior, whether you're Jewish or Gentile, is counting himself or herself unworthy of eternal life. Think about that. By condemning Jesus, you condemn yourself. When an individual refuses to be saved, it is by his or her own will. Nothing in Scripture will support throwing blame elsewhere. Outside of Christ, you choose to sin. You choose to remain unforgiven from your guilt. You choose to abide under the wrath of God. The Bible says without Christ, you are pursuing your own destruction. And that is a fearful thing. Those who will not yield to the Lord spend their zeal attending to the passing things of this world, refusing to heed the words of Jesus, about the things of God and matters of eternity, they are essentially counting themselves unworthy of eternal life. 
if one deliberately prefers sin and self to Christ and refuses his pardon, who is to blame? Who is to blame? May God have pity on those without him. And we are no better. We, we are, were just as blind and foolish apart from God's grace. So when you speak to others about the Lord Jesus, ask the Spirit to melt the hardness of their hearts for Jesus' sake. By contrast, what joy there is in believing, like these Gentiles, who when they heard the good news of God's forgiveness in Christ, began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. So we see two extremes here, extreme passion, obedience, joy in the reception of the gospel, and extreme jealousy, hatred, and persecution for those who reject the gospel. Same message brings light and joy to some and scandalizes, offends, and angers others. So the obvious question arises, why does it have one effect in some and the opposite effect in others? And that's the second thing that I want us to consider. So neutrality to truth is impossible, but God's chosen people believe the truth. God's chosen people believe the truth. Why is it that some believe and others do not? That is a question that cries out for an answer. And in verse 48, we're given the explanation. As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Now, some have tried, but I don't see how you get around the doctrines of predestination and election in these words. The verse does not say that people believed in order to be appointed to eternal life. They were appointed to eternal life, and therefore they believed. Predestination, to predetermine. God determined your destiny, my destiny, beforehand in eternity past according to his sovereign pleasure. Or to state it in another way, people are saved because God chose them to be saved. Now that might be uh, familiar to you. It might be new to you. I remember when I was going through training with Campus Crusade for Christ. I had been a Christian just two years, but I, I wanted to serve the Lord overseas. So I was reading a lot, trying to grow. I was eager to learn. And I was in the bookstore looking at the books, and I saw a purple book. Now that, that stood out because most books are not purple. So I pull it out, and on the cover it says, Chosen by God, by R.C. Sproul. And I'm, hmm, I don't know who this guy is. So I look at the back of it and it says, If God is sovereign, he chooses who goes to heaven and who doesn't. I thought to myself, this guy's crazy. What is he talking about? He doesn't know what he's talking about. I said, well, I have to get the book and read it. And if you want a book on this topic to understand predestination, that's the book I would encourage you to get, Chosen by God. As I read it, I could not refute what he said because he was pulling it directly from Scripture. And those very words are used in Scripture. Predestination. Elect. You know, God's choice. So it's all there. And I remember one phrase that really stood out in that book, and it's this. We are required to believe, teach, and preach what the Bible says is true, not what we want the Bible to say is true. And so I had to submit saying, God, I don't understand all this, but it's obvious that it's up to you. You're the one who decides who belongs to you and who doesn't. John Calvin is typically identified with this doctrine, but uh, it certainly didn't originate with him. And unfortunately, he has been judged very harshly for his view, but that evaluation is unfair. There is a very pastoral tone as Calvin explains this doctrine in his institutes. And he starts off by saying this. Suppose there is a pastor who is faithfully preaching the gospel year after year. And the pastor observes that half of the congregation responds favorably and the other half does not. 
And the pastor says to himself, I've preached the same gospel faithfully, but some responded and some did not. Why? Why? You see, he's not coming from a theoretical place, but from a pastoral perspective. And Luke is simply affirming what the rest of Scripture teaches. God chooses who will be saved. God opens the heart and mind to the truth and softens the will to accept even the most unwelcome truth about ourselves so that we see our need for Christ and believe in him. To believe in Christ is so much against the grain of our human sinful nature. To submit to God is so instinctively repulsive to a fallen human being that only the intervention of the Holy Spirit can explain it. If fallen human beings are not inclined to believe, God must give them the disposition to believe. Earlier I spoke about people who believe that truth is relative rather than absolute. Do you notice that people like that do not believe truth is relative about trivial facts that don't challenge their personal autonomy or their sinful lifestyle. People are not relativistic about stop signs, about the roundness of the earth, about the stock market. They don't claim that, well, Paris is in France for some people, but not for other people. No, people are primarily relativist about God and morality. And clearly, the existence of God as this cosmic authority is a game changer. He has a claim on our lives. And if the relative's motivation is personal autonomy or freedom rather than truth, then God is a perceived threat to their lifestyle who constrains them. You see, it's only the grace of God that can overcome that inward defiance. When all is said and done, there can be no mistaking the Bible's teaching. Jesus says... No one can come to me unless the Father in heaven draws him. Romans 9, God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will harden whom I will harden. The the final difference between believers and unbelievers does not rely or lie with us, but with God. Now, just think with me for a moment. Okay. So, in eternity past... God thought of you, if you are a Christian, if you trust in Jesus Christ, God thought of you in his mind before he even created you, and he set his affection on you and decided that in time he would draw you to your, himself, that you would become an heir of Christ, an uh, heir of God, a co-heir with Christ, and have eternal life how easy it would have been for God to think of you and just pass you by. Say, that, I know how that person's going to live. He's sinful, fallen. I, I don't want them. They don't deserve my mercy. It would be so easy for God just to turn away and to direct his affections elsewhere. But he loved you before the creation of the world. He decided that he wanted you in his family forever. What happens when you understand that and embrace that truth? It humbles you because you know it could have been otherwise. After I read that book, Chosen by God, and I didn't like it at first, it brought me to my knees in worship because I said, Oh, God, it wasn't me. I I didn't choose you because I was smart or because I realized it on my own. It's because you gave me the grace to believe. You chose me, and that's why I believed in you. It It makes a total difference to understand who the author of salvation is. Either it's all of grace, or then I had something to do with it. But the only reason you and I believe is because we were appointed for eternal life. Some people despise this doctrine exactly for the same reason they despise the gospel itself. Because they don't like the way that it lowers them. It leaves no room uh, in their, 
to, to think that, oh, I'm in control of my life, I'm in control of my destiny. It makes them entirely dependent upon God and his good pleasure. Fallen men and women are worshipers of themselves, and this doctrine lays them in the dust before God. For the Christian, this truth lies beneath true humility. What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did, not, if, if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? It lies beneath the assurance of salvation. My Father, who is greater than all, gave them to me, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. It lies beneath Christian love and gratitude. We love him because he first loved us. All of grace. Not all will believe, so how should we respond? And that's the last thing I want us to see. So we've seen that neutrality to truth is impossible. God's chosen will believe, and even when rejected, we rejoice in the truth. When the Jews rejected the gospel, Paul and Barnabas didn't quit and go home. They turned to the Gentiles in obedience to God. God intended that the Jews and their Messiah should be a light to the Gentiles. And if the Father sent Christ to be a light, you can be sure he means to open blind eyes. And so if those around you won't listen, what does Jesus say in, the, in his parables? You go out to the highways and byways and invite everyone you can to come in to sit at God's banquet even though their lives were threatened, Paul and Barnabas continued to boldly preach the gospel. When it looked like they were going to be stoned in uh, chapter 14, they fled to other cities. The point being, they did not let opposition or even the threat of death stop them from proclaiming Jesus as the light of the world. They understood that it was necessary for the gospel to go forward. They had to embrace suffering for Christ in order for that to happen. We must not say, as some people do, if God decides who is saved, then he doesn't need me because he'll save them anyway. That's unbiblical reasoning. Is that how Paul and Barnabas thought about it? Oh, well, they're giving us a hard time. I think we should stop here and just go back home because if God's going to save the Gentiles, he'll do it without us. Notice verse 49. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. Why? Because those who believed became witnesses as soon as they were converted. We are God's instruments to accomplish his will. I wonder if the reason that we don't speak about Jesus more is because we fear rejection. The fear of rejection can paralyze us. And we make all kinds of excuses because we're scared of being ridiculed or scorned. Notice what Luke says in verse 52. Even as they were driven out of the city, Paul and Barnabas were filled with joy. Were they filled with joy despite persecution or in a strange way because of it? I think Paul and Barnabas... Uh, thought that persecution was confirmation that they were on the right track. If no one opposes you and your testimony about Jesus, no one, something is wrong. <laughs> because Jesus says the world hates him. So in one sense, there's something reassuring about encountering opposition. In some cases, we have to shake the dust off our feet to put people on notice, to help them to understand that to reject Christ is to lose everything, even their very souls. You remember when Jesus sent the disciples out, he told them to wipe the dust off their feet when a town refused their message. Paul didn't say to these people, look, I'm sorry if I made you upset. Let's see if we can work that out. There was none of that. Paul loved his countrymen. Elsewhere, he said he would die in their place if he could. But what Paul realized here is that a line needed to be drawn as clearly as possible. It seems to me in the contemporary church, 
that we often take the offense out of the gospel. We have made it a safe, palatable message that will offend no one. So people say things like, if you're unhappy in life, try Jesus. He will make you happy. Just believe. That's not the gospel. Augustine said, if you believe what you like in the gospel and reject what you don't like, you do not believe the gospel but yourself. The gospel confronts every sinner with his sin. It confronts the religious sinner with his pride. It confronts the immoral sinner with his immorality. It confronts the greedy sinner with his love of money. It convicts every sinner of his or her guilt before a holy God. But then, when it lays you low, it offers you freely the grace of God who sacrificed his own son as a substitute for sinners. There's, there's a way to be forgiven. There's a way to be pardoned. The gospel shows that no one can save himself or herself, but that God will save anyone who casts themselves on Jesus. If we are saved, it's because God chose us to be saved. And that's what gives me hope. In spite of all the opposition in the world, this is what enables me to share the gospel with confidence, with boldness, because all those whom God has appointed to eternal life will believe. That is the truth. And that's what gives me hope to declare his message. Don't you get the impression, as Luke is telling this story, that God is doing something on the pages of history that no one can stop? Don't you get that impression as you read through the book of Acts that there's a, the sovereign hand of God at work? And that's what I want to leave you with. No matter what the media is saying, no matter what the academia is saying, no matter what politicians are saying, we are on the winning side. God is in charge. The Lord of glory is in control. And may that bring us comfort as we take his gospel to the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this testimony of the saving power of the gospel through the Holy Spirit. Lord, we don't know who your elect are, our responsibility is to share with as many people as possible and let you do your work. We thank you so much, Lord, that you chose to have favor on us. We did not deserve anything, and yet you adopted us into your family. We trust that you can extend that same grace to those around us, even those who seem to be so hardened you can change that heart by giving them a new heart in just a moment. We pray that we would not be discouraged if people reject the message. This is to be expected. But we trust that as we share and as you use us, that you will fulfill your good will and that you will use us to fulfill your great commission to the ends of the earth. Amen.